Hi, my name is J.R. LaFrance. La France. I am a 76-year-old physician anesthesiologist who has been interested in history, politics, geopolitics, and economy most of my life. I was a practicing physician until a month ago, in which, like uh, a lot of people, I had to download, downgrade my activities a lot. Before, I was an anesthesiologist, so was involved with uh, intensive care, etc. However, in the last few years of my life, I have not been working in the intensive care. But I'm still pretty knowledgeable as to what happens over there. Uh, I would like to get you a briefer on what's happening with the coronavirus. First, I would like to tell you what I base my later discussion on. First and foremost, the law of natural selection as uh, enunciated clearly by Darwin. Basically, it is the law of survival at its rawest, but in our society, it's not quite to that extent, but still, we cannot ignore it completely. Um, the same as in a sinking ship, we try to save the young because it's a natural instinct to further the race. Well, it's the same thing happening here. Uh, as we get older and weaker and sicker, of course, the law of natural selection chooses us to, to die as opposed to the young more often than not. Now, if we go to stat statistical forecasting models that the statistician have been using, uh, a great statistician once said, it is one-third figure, one-third past experience, and one-third intuition. If you put a too young statistician who just looks at the figure, he's missing two-thirds of the big picture. So statistical models can be fairly good or no good. They can never be perfect because statistics, you cannot get perfect figures. Number three, we can only do what is feasible in life. We are not immortal. In medicine and pu public health, we have increased the longevity of humans, but their quality, not as much. This virus is bigger than us. We have to understand that. The same as we cannot fight cancer. Sorry, oncologists, I know you have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, etc., but I'm also involved in medical aid in dying, and I know that uh, cancers usually win, except maybe for the so-called soft cancers like leukemia, Zochkin, etc. Since this thing is a virus, we do a very little treatment with it. First, a primer. Vaccines. Yes, we've developed a very good vaccine against things like measles and smallpox. We've er eradicated smallpox, and measles is pretty well close to there. Now, we have other vaccines, of course. We have vaccines for a lot of different things, like yellow fever, uh, polio, herpes, hepatitis, rubella, mumps, etc. These are all viruses. Um, maybe the most common vaccine used is the influenza virus uh, uh, vaccine. Now, vaccines for influenza is always a touch-and-go situation because the virus mutates every year. So we have to try to use our best estimate as to what will happen this year and last year, put it together in a vaccine, which in its efficacy will vary between 10 and 40 percent. Hard to really tell, period. Uh, where we have done the most inroads into viruses in their treatment, not in the vaccine side, is probably with HIV. We have medications now that will Although it's impossible to eradicate at the moment the viruses, we have done tremendous advances in controlling the viruses. Uh, most of these antiviral agents are what we call anti-replicating agents. They are not like antibiotics that kill the virus, although antibiotics could be bactericidal or static. But as a general rule, the vaccine just um, prevent the, vaccine, the virus from replicating. Now, of course, in AIDS, AIDS it's, it's, it's helped a lot the patients because they now survive. They have the virus, but they can live a close to normal life. Now, there is other 
areas in which anti-replicating agents work too also like herpes for the lips stuff like that but not that important now we i'm not saying we shouldn't do anything i mean we should work heavily into trying to develop vaccines and anti-replicating agents but at the moment we are faced with the war as it is now so in other words i don't think we can win against this virus completely we have to use guerrilla warfare what we have to do is build up what is very important is herd immunity how do we do this not by hiding from it but by going to meet it and then develop immunity against it of course according to the law of uh, uh, natural selection the older you are the sicker you are the more chance that it will kill you but we gotta the word is herd immunity so we gotta throw everybody at it so that the young who are unlikely to die from it will build up immunity and then the viruses they need people to survive so then we will get into something we call r naught r zero it's basically how transmissible the virus is statisticians have issued a number on that we know that measles is very high 12 to 18. now polio and uh, Smallpox were five to seven. This virus is somewhere between one and three. We don't really know it's new. All we can do is extrapolate from Mars, MERS and SARS. So the more people are immune in the society, the less the virus can transmit from one to the other. So instead of trying to isolate everybody from each other, we should let people do what should they do according to their stratus in society in other words i'm old i'm working because i like to work i find satisfaction in it but i don't need to work financially so let me and everybody else who wants to really hide isolate let them do it no problem okay but now saying that all these young ones should also be isolated is counterproductive they should be out there they should be meeting the virus they should develop the herd immunity once this is developed we the older people can integrate society again without too much danger because the viruses will probably be gone by then because if tr not becomes below one the virus subsides by itself it just dies it just doesn't have enough food to go from people to people this might sound very raw but in effect that's what makes sense and that's what we should have done from the beginning uh, now uh, this implies that of course i'm still living in my own home if you are an older people in a old age home that's a different story but again according to the law of natural selection a lot of these people that are in nursing homes not necessarily domiciliary care etc like you know like people that are not that sick but live there because they don't want to live in their own home but nursing homes the average longevity for these people is from what i read about six months so these people who are in the 80s 90s uh, or 70s and sick have about six months to live for whatever diagnosis they have well it's very nice to try to save them but the, the law of natural selection they're at the end of their life that's the way the human race works so of course if it gets into a nursing home at this stage these people are, are not going to be able to survive raw cruel call it whatever you want i call it life death natural selection that's what happens okay now if we go to the hospital most experts have realized that we cannot beat this virus so fast we all we can do is slow the curve down flatten the curve so we don't overwhelm the icus now mind you even if we would let it overwhelm the icu like has happened in italy of course the doctors are faced with triage they have to decide whether a ventilator goes to have 40 years old will probably have a very good chance of living or give it to an 89 year old who's got multiple comorbidities 
you know, for you that are not in a medical field, you might find this horrible, but I'm sorry, that's pretty well what, what would happen. But keep in mind, 50% of the people that are put in ventilators do die anyway. So how many real uh, people, real, not real deaths, because they would be, be dead, but how many of these people would have survived much longer anyway, with or without it? I mean, we are crazy when we say there's no price on life. There is a price on life. Obviously, if there was one person on earth and we decided to save that life and economically doom the other seven mil billion on earth, that wouldn't make sense, would it? Well, of course, that's an extreme case. But, I mean, it's like the old story, you know, with the prostitute, two bucks and a million. No one sleep with you, but two bucks. Well, we know she's a prostitute anyway. So, it's the same thing here. So now, hospitals, in my hospital, and in a lot of hospitals, we have gotten ready for this virus. Most hospitals are not being overwhelmed and will not be overwhelmed by the coronavirus. Our hospital has been ready for a month. Our ICU has been moved to another area because it has a negative pressure room, etc but they have less patients than they had they probably will not get overwhelmed they probably will always have in the next few months less patients than they normally had now i'm not saying do not get ready i know of a hospital in the states that have made a plan that in three days we can really do what our hospital has done in three days and then waited for months so let's do the plans but let's wait let's not jump ahead of whatever we if we can as the patient move into ICU from COVID, if they do, let's move the patient according to the plan to the other places and make the room for it. So a lot of the things to me have been done wrong in this, in this epidemic. And do not get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that this is not a, a worthwhile enemy. It is a serious enemy. We have to be intelligent on how we deal with it. And we cannot fight mother nature. Mother Nature wins every time. We just have to be intelligent and try to work in conjunction with her and use sense. We know about the herd immunity. Well, we should use it to our advantage against the virus. We should not doom 80% of the population, especially the young ones, economically. I'm sorry, there is a price on life. These people will also pay the price in lives because there will be suicides, there will be increase in the opioid epidemics, etc., mental health, divorces, etc. So even if you say life for life, we don't know what repercussions are going to be on this. So we have to be intelligent, use our head. I will try maybe to do other videos later and on specific points because I have a lot of other things I would like to, te to tell you about. The testing, the testing. The important thing with testing is specificity, sensitivity. I could explain you what these tools are, how you can play with those and give all kinds of statistics. It will be scary or impressive. Anyway, for now, I hope you enjoyed this first video. I hope I did not overload you. I tried to make it simple. And um, let's see where we go from here. Okay.